Baseball is, is something completely different. Baseball was good because there wasn't anything else for kids to do, you know, so a lot of kids played, everybody played baseball. There are historical figures that go beyond baseball. That's all we thought about. There was no thought about playing anything else except baseball growing up. I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Winfield, my, my friend, my brother, and longtime baseball player as as a part of uh, the project and research in Minnesota black baseball history. So Steve, I'd like you to share again baseball as it as you grew up and, uh, and the impacts and your desire to play and, and, and maybe the influence that had on your life. Well, um, growing up in St. Paul's Midway area and growing up on Carroll Avenue, which um, I still live on Carroll Avenue. Uh, my brother and I were fortunate to have a playground that was down the street from us, Oxford Playground. Uh, they call it Jimmy Lee now, but um, we probably developed a love of baseball partially because we had an older cousin, Tom Hardy, which I think even you played with Frank uh, along the way. and. He was always playing baseball, and it was just something we picked up and seemed to love to do. And um, we were always throwing, whether it was balls or throwing rocks, uh, uh, always throwing something. Probably when the twins came to town, I think in maybe 61, I um, can even remember uh, uh, my, I don't know if it was my fifth grade teacher, fifth or sixth grade teacher, maybe fifth grade teacher, Mr. Ryan, brought a TV in the room, said, uh, I want you guys to watch, want everybody to watch this game so you can tell your grandkids that you saw the first Minnesota Twins game. You know, it was, so it was baseball from now on after that. You know, that's where we got our first idols in terms of people we love to see and emulate. And uh, uh, I don't know what we would have done without that. You know, for instance, my brother David, his favorite player was uh, Zoil over Sally's, uh, played for the Twins. and. Uh, I had a couple of different ones. One was Vic Power, uh, uh, played first base, was a fancy fielding first baseman. And Camilio Pasquale, number 17, was uh, one of my favorite players. Uh, much to, that was the good news. Probably the bad news was that Camilo Pasquale threw a lot of big curve balls, and I tried to copy him throwing those big curves all the time. And back in those days, in the 60s, nobody was telling kids when you're too young don't be throwing a lot of curveball so it could wreck your arm and uh, sure enough I think it had a negative effect on my arm when I was after I was about 13 and then I came out playing and it's like oh man my arm was hurting and bothering me at the time didn't know why but uh, later on found out it's probably from trying to throw curveballs at too early of age. Steve, um, a as you played at Oxford Playground, um, do you remember, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe the guys that coached you or some of the other guys that you played with, the young guys? Um, so share some of those names and, and, and maybe your thoughts about who they were. I think that, um, you know, it's a lot of the kids of, uh, you know, of color and that's what they were mostly of right around Oxford Playground when we were growing up. That's what they came down and they, they played down there. We had good volunteer coaches and, and I think about the mentors that we had who were lived right there in the area. Uh, Mac Birch who, you know, lived a half, half a block up the street. There was a Ernie Johnson who was a mailman and he volunteered coaching. And we did some things where we helped coach in terms, we had a lot of interim, we played other teams from other playgrounds, but we also had in-house leagues going on. And, and that's probably when I first got into coaching when one of the volunteer coaches didn't show up and probably started coaching at 12 and then probably coached for about, you know, 
30, 40 years straight after that. Yeah. Steve, one of the things that for all of us when we're young kids, I know for me, I grew up playing, but I never thought, man, I wanted to get to the major leagues. Tell me, I mean, did when you played and uh, did you have dreams? Um, you know, you personally, you and David or whatever, have dreams of like, okay, I want to, I want to do this. I want to make it to the majors. I want to go to college or whatever. Did did any of that ever fit for you? Now that's that's interesting. You ask because at a point, I, well, I guess again, the Twins were here in '61, so. It was cool watching them, and it probably wasn't until Zoilo Versalles, the Twins were going to sign him as a rookie. But I remember when they talked about signing Versalles, and there was something on TV, and I can't remember it was either a bonus or what they were going to sign him for, but it was like $5,000. And I remember me and my brother, you know, I mean, we were pretty poor growing up, and we heard that figure. Oh man, $5,000 for playing baseball. Oh man, that's what we got to do one of these days, you know. <laughs> so that was a thought that probably hit us then. Again, you know, you don't know if you're going to make it there, but it planted the seed in our mind. So tell me a little bit, uh, or, or tell us really again, I, that I think the, the uh, history about your career at the University of Minnesota is extremely important for, for many reasons. First of all, to give you credit to let people know how good you were. And, and, uh, and then secondly, maybe we can get into a little bit of the controversial <laughs> stuff after that. After, you know, I'm again a year ahead of my brother David and, uh, and you know, we won a, out of the community, you know, we won a couple state championships for, Attic Brooks American Legion Baseball, we won in 67, 68, and they didn't quite win it in 69, but fall of 68, you know, I went to the U, played freshman ball, and I think I had a successful freshman year. Then uh, that was the days of, you know, civil rights, a lot of marches and a lot of protests and things, and, um, mm, and that was a part of my life. Um, I became involved in that. And, and I think as far as a sports career goes, the coaches probably didn't uh, appreciate that a lot, me being involved you know, in that. And so probably from practicing indoors and maybe being uh, on the first string list before we went out outside we're going to go out in the spring and, and I remember I went to a, a you know black student conference in Oakland California that spring right before we were to go outside and um, you know then when I came back uh, my uh, s number one status as an outfielder seemed to have kind of slipped uh, two or three or whatever and uh, you know, and so I just kind of never regained it, you know, so that was kind of, uh, um, you know, my career status had changed at the University of Minnesota. That, that's, that was kind of the end of my baseball career over there. I was still working at uh, Oxford Playground as a coach, um, working at the rec center, you know, to me, Shoot, life was good, you know, I wasn't thinking about, God, I missed out on the chance of possibly going to the pros and, and you know, and you eventually, you know, worked over there with us at the playground and, and so working with kids and training them and, and coaching them, that felt like about most of anything that I wanted to do in life. In fact, I felt that I probably wanted to be a teacher. I knew I wanted to work with young people and so I was trying to get my teaching certificate at the U so I could teach at probably elementary level or any level. Um, I did eventually get my degree. It wasn't in, I didn't get my teaching certificate, but I ended up working with kids all my life and, you know, still do. So that's kind of a natural part of what I've always done. I don't want to go necessarily into all of the, the Dick Siebert thing <laughs> and, 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 and that at this point in time. Other than to say, 
It is really unfortunate, and as we've discussed um, that situation, you also shared another piece of information with me, and, and, and while, while I know the Dick Siebert deal, it was extremely disappointing to me um, that other community people thought different of, of why you didn't play baseball. Can you share that story a little bit with, with me? Well, I, and again, I don't know how many people in the community. In fact, I, I appreciate the fact to this day there are a number of people who are, you know, old enough to remember or to see me playing. And again, shoot, I played up until not too many years ago, up until 55, I was still out there playing with the, you know, the college boys and things. Um, uh, and there were some of the old timers. I, maybe the story that I told you was being in the barber shop one time, and one of the old timers who cuts hair and things in there said, "Yeah, your brother's doing pretty good in the pros." I said, "I hear you could have made it in the pros too." I said, "Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know, you know." But then they said, "Yeah, but didn't you? Somebody told me you got." caught up on that old stuff, or drug stuff, or what? And I said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't do drugs. I haven't never been part of the, that culture or whatever, so why, why would you say, who said that, you know? And, and of course, like people who a lot of times hear rumors or say something, then they'll, they'll say, well, I'm not gonna, I don't know who said it, I'm not gonna tell you or whatever. And, uh, and that was one of those things that uh, you or anybody who knows me or know what I do or what my health habits are or have been, it's like um, that probably kind of hurt my heart hearing a community person say that, that they thought that um, some illicit things that I might have done were why I didn't, wasn't able to play ball, <laughs> you know, so, but, um, uh, so, but again, I think overall, for the most part, most people in the community have been supportive of uh, what I've done or been a part of over the years, and, and baseball has been a big part of it. Like I said, I probably coach baseball or softball, and, and I still do training to this day, you know, with lessons and clinics, uh, not only in the neighborhood, but, you know, all around the state and even out of state at different times. And, I'm very proud of that, the fact that I have some things to be able, I feel, to pass on to other people and over the years. And, and it was kind of cool because uh, you and I, over the last, you know, 10 years, you know, you weren't really around baseball. People thought of Frank White as just basketball before, but then uh, discovered that you, just like anybody else that's close to our age, always played baseball. Baseball was a big part of our lives growing up. All right, thank you, All Frank right. Stephen Winfield. <laughs> to the other Frank. <laughs> I'd like to introduce everybody to Woody Larson, who uh, Woody was my peewee, or no, midget baseball coach at Ober Boys Club, and, and uh, it's great to have him here with me as I continue my conversations and research on uh, Minnesota black baseball. Woody, welcome to the interview. Thank you. And uh, what, <laughs> what, I, what I'd love to do, Woody, is have you talk a little bit about your playing career, uh, wherever you want us to take that, you know, when you began and, and, and maybe where you finished uh, type of thing. That would be great for us. Okay, I'll try not to make this too boring. Uh, uh, <laughs> I uh, was a young kid that grew up in North Minneapolis, in the Camden area of North Minneapolis, and, and uh, spent my time, like you, Frank, in athletics, particularly football, hockey, and baseball, and um, was really captured by baseball and, and uh, went on to play high school baseball and then played at, first at Bethel College and then Augsburg College. And uh, during the time I was at, um, I can't remember which of the two colleges, but I met 
a man I think you know, uh, who was then a Brooklyn Dodger baseball scout, Jerry Flathman. Mm -hmm. I was a catcher, and in those days, of course, like now, the umpire was right over your shoulder. So I became very good friends with Jerry Flathman and was invited to the Dodger tryout camp. And in that process, I, uh, I had thought, being in college, that maybe I could earn some extra money as a bullpen catcher for the Millers. And so I went and talked to a guy by the name of Rosie Ryan, who was the general manager of the, the Millers and were owned by the New York Giants. And uh, he said that I had to be under contract to be on the field during the game, and I, I wasn't. I was just a college guy, but he extended an invitation to try out with the Millers, which I did, I think it was for about a week. And then uh, I was still in college and so on, but they gave me an invitation to come anytime I wanted to and catch batting practice. I was a catcher, as I said, <clears throat> and uh, catch batting practice and so on. And in the process of that, I did that for parts of two years. And um, the color line had just gone out of baseball. I think it was... I think it was 1947 that Jackie Robinson signed with the Dodgers. <clears throat> and the Millers, at the time I worked out with them, had two black ball players, And I uh, dressed right next to one of them. And that was the uh, pitcher. And then right next to him was Ray Dandridge, who was a Hall of Fame I never, I think he never played a major league game because he was too old, right. but still made the, was picked the Hall of Fame. And the, uh, and the pitcher I dressed right next to was Dave Barnhill. Right. And he was, uh, so they, they were the only two black ball players that the Millers had. So that was my first taste of what being a professional ball player would be. And, um, Anyway, that's kind of where it went from there. And then I, um, uh, I had become involved in your community, okay. the Rondo Avenue area, and uh, I became the director of the Over Boys Club in 1956 and uh, wanted to get baseball started, which we did. Right. You, of course, were... One of these kids, along with oh, Roger Neal, Bill Price, that we called Wells, uh, kids that really went on to become some pretty good ball players. And in fact, Bill Price, Wells, I had called Jerry Flathman. I think Wells was about 13 years of age. And I told Jerry, you watch this kid. He's got some real possibilities. He was a catcher, yeah. um, threw right-handed, batted left, but he could hit a ball like it was just unbelievable for a 12, 13-year-old kid how he could hit. Right. And then he got to high school and some track coach convinced him, I guess, that he should stop playing baseball and start running track. And, and he tore up the St. Paul Conference, I guess, running track. Right. But... Uh, I really think would have had some real strong possibilities if he'd have continued playing baseball. The difficult challenge for for us as young people, or or the way things were, as you had talked about, this was in uh, '56 or '57, and yeah. and even Major League Baseball hadn't completely become uh, desegregated because the Red Sox didn't finally sign Pumsey Green until 1959. Yeah. So even Major League Baseball was still segregated, so to, so to speak, in, in, or had a quota system. Yeah. Um, and I think after Jackie Robinson was signed, then I think the next black ball player was Larry Doby, yeah. Yeah. Uh, played with Cleveland. Yeah. And then you had Luke Easter and, and a, a number, but it was right. really pretty uh, 
pretty segregated. Right. When I worked out with the Millers, like I said, the two black ball players were here and there, and then of course the rest of the clubhouse. So it was really pretty much segregated, even though they at least had my ball players playing with them. Triple A baseball back then, like in the 40s, uh, the baseball was as good as the major leagues yeah. today because uh, there weren't that many major league teams. And then when you look at the guys that played there and and succeeded and then, and then went up, uh, quite a compliment. Well, every team, like when I was growing up, Frank, there were just 16 major league teams, eight American League and eight national, but every one of those teams had great, some great pitchers. The, you remember the quotation, uh, spawn and sane and pray for rain. Right. You know, the Boston <laughs> Braves were on the bottom, right. but they had Johnny Sane and Warren Spawn, which were as good as any team in baseball, though they were down in the cellar a lot of times. But so I think you're right. The uh, nowadays there's a, there's just a dearth of pitchers. Uh, twins are a good example. The, the, the pitching is really weak. The right. Starting pitching. Right. And in those days, those Triple A teams were loaded with uh, good pitchers from yeah. top to bottom and. So really. when you talk about pitchers today, um, as as we become more protective of arms, uh, in and young kids and curveballs and stuff like that, kids get limited. One of the problems with pitching right now is their arms aren't very strong, and they just don't have arm strength to to last. You know, when I grew up, Frank, if you were a kid that liked baseball. That's all there was to do, yeah. was to play baseball, and and so you, you are you threw, you know you lived with a glove on your hand from the time you woke up, till the time you went to bed. There wasn't cabins and boats and trailers and camps and all these kind of things. You played ball, yeah. yeah. And I I think that part of the, you know I'm just amazed today at how many of these major league pitchers need Tommy John surgery and things like that. And, and I, I really believe it's because the arm strength isn't there right. because they haven't played enough before they became uh, major league ball players. You know, it's in, in my, my father um, never said, you need to go out and play ball. I just, I would go with my dad and watch, and I knew he was on these all-black baseball teams, so it was always very special to me. And, and, and baseball has been, uh, even though a lot of people think about basketball, and, and I'm you know involved with basketball a lot, baseball was the first game that I played and, yeah. and, and I really loved. And uh, I happen to believe, Frank, that <clears throat> baseball did more to bring about bring about the whole civil rights thing than any other thing because when you know when you think of the number of black kids who could have made it in baseball and never had a chance because they were well like right. like Ray Dandridge yeah. Never played a major league game, from what I understand. Right. I mean, he was an old man when he dressed right one away from me, right. and I would see this guy, and then realize that he went into the Hall of Fame, never having played a major league game. Yeah. Think of all the hundreds of guys that were just like he or Willie Mays or the rest of these guys, who really never had a chance because of the. Uh, skin restriction, right, right. ridiculous. There were a lot of guys, uh, Woody, that 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 I played against when you coached us uh, up at Oxford. Uh, they actually never played baseball in high school, and I've talked to a couple of them since then, and uh, and have asked the question, well, how come you never played in high school? And and they kind of said, well, because we saw more opportunity in track. 
than, than we saw in baseball. So, uh, so I, it's, it's interesting, and I have a theory about that uh, in terms of those things, but I think you're right in, in that there were a lot of guys that could have played, could have played and, and, uh, and the opportunity just wasn't there. Well, especially uh, guys coming up, black kids coming up from the South. I mean, Willie Mays is a perfect example uh, you know, he was head and shoulders above even the guys that played with the Minneapolis Millers. I right. mean, you know, and and then of course a guy that I always idolized, who played with the Saints a short time, was Roy Campanella, yeah. and I had a chance to meet him, and after he was um, paraplegic, but it was interesting to meet Roy Campanella and all of these guys that now are um, they're historical figures that go beyond baseball even yeah, yeah. and it was just a lot of fun for me as a young college kid uh, that was that experience was priceless oh. in my life it, it, and it was for me and I, I know for many kids we have some great memories what do you were were uh, out of time and, yeah and well this wow. has been I, I so appreciate you taking time and, and, oh, and coming and sharing. I appreciate being invited. So, yeah, so it's a great thing. You were, you were a great influence to, oh, a, to a lot of young people, both boys and girls, because girls used to come down there too. Yeah. And I remember one time, and I can't remember what the game was, but I'm going to say this because your, your, your grandson is here. And I remember there was a game, and I don't remember who you guys played, but I remember you hit a home run over that center field fence, and the ball would have landed on Rondo, and and uh, it had the short right field fence because it was that shorter block, yeah. but left field was that long block. So when the ball went over center field, I remember when you hit that ball, I was just amazed. So so it was a great memory for me, <laughs> and and I want to well, share I that close with you. I want to share that with your grandson <laughs> who is here with us, so that he knows that maybe some of those things that you've shared with them are absolutely true. Well, I, I I remember that. We played a neighborhood team of men. Okay. And these were some guys I had played with in high school and college. And I must have uh, gotten lucky because I remember <laughs> hitting that thing. Yeah, yeah, it went a long way. It went a long way. Well, thank you so much, Woody. Thank, thank you for inviting me, Frank. I, I just, I think the world of you, you know that. Well, and, I appreciate uh, that. And, and you've now become a part of our Minnesota black baseball history. Well, that's, I'm privileged. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Woody. Great to see you, oh, Frank. Yeah. Great seeing you, too. I'm here with my friend, my mentor, uh, community leader, and uh, local historian, Jim Robinson. And Jim, welcome, uh, uh, and thank you for being a part of this history project. Thanks, for me. So, Jim, I'd like to talk to you about, uh, take you back to some of the conversations we've had before and, and, uh, and have you share that information again. Um, we've talked about uh, where teams played. We've talked about uh, George White, Dennis Ware. We've talked about Negro League teams coming through here. We've talked about uh, Welcome Hall or Ober Boys Club Field, the Hollow, et cetera, and then individual players. And, and I'd love for you to just share some of that story, uh, however it fits for you. Well, I, I think it all fits. And the reason why it all fits, because uh, back then we were a very small community. Uh, when I say very small, I'm referring to the African-American community. Back then we were basically relegated to what was known as the Rondo community. And then as we move up St. Anthony in the westward direction, the Ober Boys Club was built. And that was built around 1947, thereabouts, 48. Uh, and, uh, and I lived uh, very close to where that was being built. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, I happened to uh, be what they called a bat boy. And bat boys were kind of like uh, the kid who run around and, 
and did whatever whatever the manager said you had to do. And if the ball player said you had to do something, you did that too. The other part of that, and this is something that we, that we don't see today, and maybe uh, there's been no talk about it, but gloves used to be left on the field. And now we don't leave our gloves on the field. We bring them in with us. Players uh, in, in, in that time used to take their gloves and throw it off to the side. And when they came in, uh, they came in without their gloves. And, and of course, when we used to have the barnstorming teams you know, come to the Twin Cities, and basically they would come to uh, St. Paul, and then sometimes they would go to Minneapolis. But long and short of, of that conversation is the Negro ball players who were barnstorming used to come to Lexington Ballpark and there would be poster signs on our telephone poles and they would show a few of the ball players you know, making various different plays on the field to uh, advertise the fact that team, whatever the team was, was going to be playing on such and such a day or night at the Lexington Ballpark. And most of the times there'd be double headers. Uh, and so people, people got their money's worth to go to the ballpark and see the teams from across the, the United States come to Minnesota. And then we had other African-American ballplayers who, as I mentioned earlier, I thought could have been major league ballplayers and, and a few of them, uh, and I'll just name some of them. Uh, okay. Johnny Cotton is one uh, who really comes to mind. He was probably one of the slickest feeling shortstops that you ever wanted to see. And of course, your dad. You know, your dad was, your dad, in my opinion, was the greatest catcher who played baseball in that era. It, it appeared to me, or in my research, I went through a lot of yearbooks. Now, I know a lot of yearbooks didn't always capture everybody's name because of the way pictures were taken. But as I got into the late 40s and 50s, there were guys that played baseball. I would see their name like in the spokesman recorder or they've been mentioned before as baseball players, but they, they didn't show up in their high school baseball team. And uh, can you talk about that a, a little bit at all? Or? Well, <clears throat> One of the things that you that you have to remember, and 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 one of the areas that people kind of forget, that African American kids were not always free to participate in athletics, even at the high school level, and coaches didn't encourage African American kids to play baseball. Uh, you were encouraged to run track. Okay. You were encouraged to play football. And you were never encouraged to play basketball, even though the greatest athletes were basketball players. But they weren't encouraged to play basketball. Okay. Why weren't they encouraged to play basketball? Why weren't they encouraged to play baseball? Because it was always considered a sport for white athletes. Okay. It was never considered a sport to where that black athletes would shine and eventually, quote unquote again, take over as we see today in some of our sports. And still today, we don't see enough African American kids playing baseball. Now, are we not encouraging them to do it? I don't know. And, and I say that in all honesty, but a lot of that has to do with how we start them. It's got a lot to do with what goes on in the house. We've got a lot of parents who are younger parents. Well, what you and I would call younger, uh, they're in their 30s. Right. And baseball is not a good word for them. Right. Basketball and football is, so that's what my kid's going to do. As you said, how do we get more kids involved or how do we get them to think about it? I, it it's difficult, although there are more kids playing today, but it, it's really challenging because the, the little bit that we talk about it, 
we're competing with TV and video games and and moms and dads that watch the NBA and think they're a coach and and all of those other influences that go on. But it goes right along with you, with what you're saying about the the influences of, of whether we're sharing with kids about the game of baseball or girls with softball uh, at the same time. So, well, let's let's go another round with that okay. because you 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 mentioned the other sport, the other sport opposite baseball, which is softball. Right. The greatest opportunity for girls, in my opinion, to go on to school to be educated and even to play afterwards is softball. Right. Yep. And we have very few of our young African-American females going in the direction of softball. The other part of this is it's the, it's the maturate, maturation part of what we do with our kids and people wanting instant gratification. Mm -hmm. Baseball is not instant gratification. It's, it's a method of how you learn and then you begin to hone those skills over a period of years. Right. We live in a climate where it's a lot different than the warmer climates in the South. Right. Why do we think that all of these training camps for baseball is in the South or in the Southwest? Right. Yeah. The weather. Yeah. The weather. Yeah. So if we know that, why aren't parents becoming aware of the fact that in order for their child to be a good baseball player, it takes time. This isn't going to happen overnight. This isn't like basketball where you can go in the gym and shoot uh, a thousand shots and take a shower and come back and shoot a thousand more. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, baseball is, is something completely different. Number one, you got to learn how to have good eye and hand coordination. Then you got to learn how, what that bat is about, how to hold it, how to grip it, how to time yourself to hit the baseball. Timing, eye coordination with your hands, with the bat. A lot of kids aren't willing to do that. One of the things that I'd, I'd really like to capture, Jim, is some of the conversations that, that we've had regarding um, the things that were happening in, in St. Paul and, and I'm sure other places, but specifically St. Paul and Minneapolis as it relates to um, covenants about people buying houses or you couldn't, you could only eat in certain places. There were no hotels. and and so how that impacted people here and maybe when baseball players came here uh, to live or whatever, some of the struggles they also had to go through um, different than maybe other, other places or white baseball players. Well, <clears throat> it was known that, and you use the term of eating certain places, uh, the white community in St. Paul and in Minneapolis did well more so in St. Paul than Minneapolis. Did not allow African Americans, whether they were ball players or whether they were just regular residents, to enter into a number of places. Uh, it was it was known that uh, African Americans had a place, and the place was called the Rondo Community, and some other examples of that. When we when we talk about just the living conditions, 85% of the people, meaning African-American people, did not own property in St. Paul of those 4,000 that I'm referring to. You know, we've heard of redlining. Uh, there are a lot of people who were redlined who could have purchased property but didn't have the whereabouts. Uh, no one would assist them. There were banks who wouldn't accept them, uh, and that was part of the life of, of St. Paul. My friend, thank you so much, and, and I really appreciate you, you sharing and being a part of this history project and, 
and uh, we've had these conversations many times and and now some of it um, is, is now in what do they call it perpetuity or whatever because it's it's it'll be on film and this stuff stays forever so it's it's a great legacy to all of us so well. You know, we really didn't get a chance to, to talk about a lot of the things that we've talked about prior to, and that's, that's you know, comes at another time. Um, I have a son who's a historian, and when you do history, it never ends. Because what always seems to happen is that when you get one piece of information that leads to another piece of information, and before you know it, you're digging in holes that you never thought that you'd be digging in to get where you want to go and to get the information. So I really appreciate the fact that you are able to, able to do this. And kudos to you, sir. So you're right. There's so many more pieces that lead. And, and, and it's been an exciting time for me to, to go through this. And, and I, I only hope I can get it completed and in, 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 in a book fashion or add to the exhibit so that other people will be able to uh, benefit from, from all of this knowledge that many people have and, and, and we don't lose it because it's an important part of history. So thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm here with uh, Bill Peterson, my, my friend, my mentor, um, and uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, my research project on Minnesota black baseball. Um, Bill, welcome and, and thanks for, for doing this. And if we could start off with maybe you talking about uh, your baseball career. All right, well, I started uh, playing baseball when I was 10 on the east side of St. Paul, Hazel Park Playground. Uh, a few years after that, we moved to the, what was called the Summit U now, it was Selby Dale when I moved there, and there was no baseball team for me to play with. So my dad didn't know anything about baseball, but he was a good organizer. So he got the Selby District Commercial Club to sponsor a baseball team. And actually that was the first time I think I became a coach because my dad didn't know anything. And I actually coached, it was 15, 14 and 15 year olds, and I actually was the I guess you'd call it a player coach at the time. So I always consider that as my, my start in coaching. Didn't really realize that that would be a springboard for me later on in life uh, to be a coach. But let me back up a second, But because before I played that, I played for your dad when I was 15 years old. Uh, he got a sponsor from Lowen and Campbell, uh, which was a sporting goods place at the time. And we had a lot of fun. We played a lot of baseball, and your dad was such a, such a great guy in terms of uh, having us have fun playing baseball. Uh, but the one thing I will always remember about when I played for your dad was one day my dad was sitting up in the stands watching us play. And he said to, uh, or some people were talking, and they said, boy, that catcher sure is light. <laughs> of course, it was an all-black team except for me. I was the only Afro-Cajun on the team. But back to the American Legion. Nobody took Central because it was such a large enrollment. There were only a couple kids that were good enough to play Legion ball. So I ended up playing for another all-black team, and it was a, a, a men's team. They call it senior men, but it really doesn't means senior like 65 and over, it just means over 18. So I played with them during the summer and then I went to the Marine Corps right after that summer. Baseball was good because there wasn't anything else for kids to do, you know, so a lot of kids played, everybody played baseball. You played baseball or you sat home and did nothing. So, so everybody played. As you furthered your coaching career, um, Many people remember your coaching of Addicts Brooks and, and the success of the teams and, and the people that played with you. Um, and uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, uh, Addicts Brooks was American Legion post in the neighborhood. And because 
a lot of kids weren't getting picked up from Central, like I had mentioned. Uh, Addix Brooks, we started the team as 15 years old, so we, we had two years of the junior program before we moved the kids up into the Legion program. And when we moved them up into the Legion program, we were, the post was one of the big boosters of getting it changed from the school you go to to a boundary of where you lived. So now all the kids that lived in the central area would play on the team, whereas before somebody wouldn't pick up Central High School because its enrollment was too large. And you could only have so many, uh, your enrollment, like if you went to four small schools, like a St. Thomas and a Cretan and uh, North End or something like that, you could get kids out of four or five schools that had small enrollment, and you couldn't get, like you could only pick Central because their enrollment was the same size as these other schools. Mm -hmm. So when we moved the, Legion, the, uh, the junior team up into the Legion program, that's how we had an opportunity of keeping all these kids playing because it wasn't by enrollment anymore, it was by uh, where you lived. And it's, and, it's, and it's so good to hear that because I, I think for people today or, or older people today or young kids today, they, they don't know that. They, they, everybody thinks it's just all about basketball or football because we, we haven't really had a, a Dave Winfield for like a long time. Um, recently or, or recently, 83, we had a Sean McCamey. Um, that might be the, the last African-American guy out of here that made it to the, to the major leagues with the Dodgers. But we haven't had an African-American player that I can think of, you know, in the last, well, if, if 83 was when Sean came out, that's almost 20 years now. Um, and we've had a lot of great athletes come out in other sports, but we, we just don't have anybody that, that kids can emulate or, or want to be like. And, and, uh, and that's having an impact baseball-wise or whatever. So, Well, the funny thing, you know, when we talked about the in-house league we had at Oxford, well, you know who coached all those teams? Dads, dads that had played ball. Mm -hmm. Now that was in the 60s. By the time we got up to the 80s, these kids that had played in the 60s, they weren't playing ball. So now when they had kids, they played basketball and football. They gave up baseball a long time ago. Right. So if your dad doesn't play baseball, you know, or right. somebody in the family, you're probably not gonna continue playing. And that's, I think, what, where the fall-off came at Oxford. I don't know where the fall-off came nationally, and I think a lot has to do with there's the stars in the eyes that you can make it in basketball and you can make it in football. So kids right away when they're young, you know, they, they look at the stars in the eyes, and that's what they kind of move toward. Right. The other thing is baseball is a, it's a boring. You know, in this day and age, people like movement. Right. Baseball is like a chess game. It's extremely slow except for the few seconds where it's extremely fast. So our society right now is not geared toward that chess match or you know, even when they go watch, when people go watch baseball now, they don't watch for the magic of the bunt. They don't watch for the great throw from the outfielder or somebody overplaying the fly ball and and not taking a bunch of steps and throwing somebody out, they're there to see the home run. Right. They're there only to see the magic of somebody hitting the long ball, right. but they don't realize how much magic there is in the bunt, you know, to move somebody around. And so I think there's a lot of factors in this day and age of why I don't want to say African Americans aren't playing, because I think a lot of kids aren't playing. There's so many other choices. Right. I mean, in the summertime, we got AAU basketball, we got football camps. There's so much stuff going on, and, and baseball is kind of taking a backseat to it. Any other thoughts come to mind that maybe impacted? You know, you talked about the the in-house league. That's one thing that impacted kids. A lot of kids that were there, 90 percent or whatever, 95 percent were were African American kids. Can you think of anything else? That, that may have been another impact on, 
on why kids play or, or why they don't play? Well, when I got out of service in early 60s, kids 10 and under, 10, 11, 12, all played in the morning. You know who coached those kids in the morning? 15, 16 year old kids. There was a lot of field space because games were played in the morning, you know, so the fields were used. I would say in the, right around the 80s, you started this thing where everybody had to play at night. T-ball played at night. T-ball needed a field to play on. Well, you know, T-ball doesn't need a field. You can put four T-ball teams out here in an area, but all of a sudden, and I think what it was was parents wanted to see their kids play, which is a natural thing. So you had a change from the fields being used in the morning, kids coaching kids, and so there was that leadership learning by coaching kids. Plus, when you coach, you, know, you end up learning more about the game yourself. So I think we had a carryover from those 14-year-olds that were coaching the 10s. They wanted to keep playing because now they learned this game better. So they would play when they were 16 and 17 and play in high school. Today, everything is played at night, no matter what age group. There's no field space available. So nobody practices anymore because everybody's playing games at night. And the kids, nowadays, people won't accept kids coaching kids. You have, maybe you can have a, a kid, a 15, 16 year old, assisting an adult, but Everybody says that kids can't do it, so they want an adult coaching their kid. So we lost that avenue for these young kids to learn how to coach and continue playing. We lost practice time because there's no field space. So I think that's a change why a lot of people have lost their interest in, in baseball. And we also were so We've got so many other activities. You know, we lost five or six softball fields at McMurray because they artificially turfed those fields for soccer. What has happened is that it not only has evolved and changed where everybody plays at night now, but we don't have any field space, so you never see kids do pickup games. You, all you do is if you do get a practice, you only get that field for an hour, so you're playing baseball for an hour. You can't get a bunch of kids together because there's no field space. So there are a lot of different things that have impacted why a lot of kids aren't playing, why there isn't as much interest in what used to be the main sport of America, probably now football, you know, and basketball. But what happened to me, I got out of baseball for about 25 years. I was on the National Empire staff for softball and so my energies were in training umpires around the country and national tournaments and, and that type of thing. When I came back and left the, the national umpire staff, came back, got back into baseball, it was like cultural shock for me because we used to have a practice at Oxford. Kids would ride their bikes and there'd be a pile of bikes there. You could practice for two, three hours if things went good. If they didn't go good, 15 minutes you sent them home. Nowadays, first of all, nobody rides their bike because they're afraid either the bike's going to get swiped or uh, might get run over or whatever, might get stolen. Uh, so the cars drop the kids off. And when the cars drop the kids off, mom wants to know what time practice will end because she's not only dropping her son off, She's got somebody playing this over there and somebody taking this over there. So now I had to reorient myself to set my practice from this time to this time. So the whole structure, everything had changed from when a bunch of kids would come down and play and you could practice as long as you wanted to. Now you had to confine your practice and you had to be done at a certain time. You couldn't go over if it was going great. You couldn't send the kids home early because, you know, because somebody's picking them up. Time. So the structure of your practice had had to change. And 
it seems like every five or six years there is a change in our society in terms of what's accepted and what isn't accepted. And what's accepted now from a coach is so different than it was. I feel for our youth coaches because they got parents on their necks, they got liabilities, they have to learn and they have to take these tests on concussions. They have to, I mean, it's just, it's just so much pressure on a, a youth coach who's just volunteering. So there's a lot of, of changes that have happened in, the, I'd say, the last 30 years for sure. Really big changes where a lot of kids don't play the game of baseball for a lot of various reasons. Man, my friend, thank you so much again for, for taking your time and, and being here and, and adding to this history. I mean, so I, I really appreciate that. And um, so, um, so thank you. My pleasure, Frank. My pleasure.